I've had the opportunity to work in different, um, I would say, disease areas. Um, so HIV, maternal, newborn, and child health, and then um, non-communicable diseases. Okay. So currently, I'm working on cardiovascular disease. So I'm the founder of Vida Healthcare. Okay. A digital health um, startup that is dedicated at helping people of African descent to identify their risk factors yeah. for heart diseases. Um, and then we provide them with the resources that they will need to make changes in their lifestyle yeah. based on their life stage to reduce those um, risk factors. And then we monitor and track um, gradually observing the amount of people dying around me from cardiovascular diseases, as you know, and seeing the fact that it's not getting enough attention, even yeah. like I mentioned, even from the local people themselves and and um, the, the policy makers. Our, in Nigeria, our policy, health policies are skewed towards infectious diseases. Everybody's mm, affected. Mm, by it. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Everything is a serious killer. Don't, um, it's, it's, it should not be underestimated. Yep. It's still one of the um, major killers of people who are under the age of five years, children. Um, and then you think of other infectious diseases, meningitis, measles, you know, those ones are really, really very serious. But yeah. as people be get old, then the issues around non-communicable diseases begin to emerge. Yeah. And you begin, like you rightly mentioned, you begin to see uncles drop at the age of 30, 40, as you know, and then you ask why. Why? Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Good, good, good. Bridget, yeah. See, uh, I really want to talk to you about uh, healthcare. You know, my personal uh, story and uh, there's so many, so many public health issues going around in our community and uh, it's important for us to talk about these things. Because uh, I think many of us don't understand what public health is. So I want to talk about your work and other things around your work. Okay. So help me uh, introduce yourself to my audience and tell them who you are and what you do. Yeah, um, thanks, Akene, for the opportunity. So basically, um, Dr. Bridget Akudu Mwabara, I'm a medical doctor who believes in keeping hearts beating forever. So, um, and to do that, I have to wear three fundamental caps. So okay. one as a medical health practitioner who sees patients, and then the second one as a public health specialist who has the capacity to influence both policy and community level practices. Yeah. And then finally, as a researcher who has to collect data and you make sure that this data informs the practice decisions that people take in the hospitals and also policy making. And if possible, also the decisions people take in their homes. So basically, um, that's how I like to describe myself. Okay, that's that's very good. See, uh, as a researcher, that, that that means you are one of the uh, less than five percent of doctors who are actually scientists. <laughs> <laughs> you oh. know, because because people people generally think doctors are scientists. Okay, and I tell people, no, not. Very few doctors actually are actually scientists. You are you you do research. That's good. That's good. So yeah, but you know, like I can clarify that. So every doctor is a scientist because the we have to make decision, um, make scientific decisions. Yeah, okay. So there's a way if you look at science from the angle of 
not just um, research, like yes. but it's okay. putting the research findings into practice. That's okay, one yes. Big part that people forget, and that's often of, that's where it often gets modeled. Mm. You know. So well, as we talk let, later, let me, let me ask you, you. I can give you instances. Let, let me ask you: mm-hmm. Is every computer engineer a scientist? Well, um, they are not. <laughs> they they use the knowledge from science to yes. that and that's exactly yeah, so, what doctors do. So the the thing is for the medical health profession mm. is not that differentiated. Okay. So every day in the life of a doctor, you will have to when you see a doctor who is seeing patients. Yeah. So after seeing patients, then they have to get back and then review. You see, yeah. so that's where the research comes. So every doctor has to review their caseload okay. for all their patients. Okay. Maybe, 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 maybe I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so that's where, uh, so that's what I'm saying, that if you look at it from that dedicated, yeah. like dedicated researchers. Yes, there are doctors yeah. who are dedicated researchers. Researchers, yes. Yes. And those, then, those are the, one, yeah. the ones I consider as, Scientists. <laughs> no, every doctor has do, to do they, research. After do, doing the practice, they do the research, they do data col- collection, analysis. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. Not everyone, but all of them have to do that for their practice. So okay. if you see right. right. 50 cases, then you have to um, make sure that the 50 clients, mm. you review them, they're human beings. So you have yeah. to review how all their various biomarkers and their function yeah. you know, is adding up to be able to help inform your next decision when they come back. Okay. And probably by then they've gathered more data. So that's why in the life of a doctor, you see a doctor going from practice when they're by the, you know, on the desk seeing clients by the patient's bedside, yeah. patient, uh, you know, clients as well. And then when they are doing the reviews in the offices, and then also sometimes when they are being called on to make some practice decisions, like okay. they say, okay, we're closing the clinic on XX day because yeah. on XX day, there are not many people who come mm. in. So we can as well just keep a few people while yeah. the other one. So those kind of decisions have to be evidence informed. That is that mm. time. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Very good. So yeah. like I said earlier, uh, many of us don't understand public health okay uh or, or it, its importance so let's start by you telling us what public health is and what the the public health projects that you are involved in yeah thank you so um i'll simplify it okay so basically when um people think about healthcare they think about healthcare about going to see the doctor mm. anytime so um so when seeing the doctor that's that's um hell you know that's an individual seeking help so when yeah. the doctor saves that life that is a doctor saving one life at a time yeah however there are many policy and practice decisions that can save lives in millions. And so those policy practice issues yeah. will fall under public health. Okay. Because they look simple, but they save lives in millions. Yeah. And um and a simple example is something like institutionalizing hand washing. So okay. it's very it's something that people do at home um it's something that people do on their own yeah so putting in place just hand making sure that there is hand washing because it's something that saves lives in millions yeah. you know so making sure you prevent all possible um infectious diseases just through washing of hands yeah is a public health thing because you have to make sure that you take policy decisions that make sure that the water is available, that the soaps are available, you know, 
and you have to put them in places that is open to the public and can be assessed. So not just put them in parks, you know, public toilets, make sure, you know, everywhere that people can wash hands. Yeah. So as simple as that intervention is, that's one example of what public health is. So it's not just as um, saying, as simple as telling people, go and wash your hands, mm. go and wash mm. your hands. You, so you, you sure, enable them by making sure the tools and whatever is available. Yeah. Yes. So that's, that's, so that's public health. So um, I've had the unique opportunity of working on multiple public health um, projects. So, and then, so I would say to expand further on what public health is, you would have to then think about, I've just used hand washing as an example. So, making sure first people are educated are well informed and are able to use the knowledge they have to take action mm. at the everywhere you find individuals to wash their hands at the individual level take it a step further you need to make sure that communities are committed to preventing diseases through hand washing so that is where community practices community structures community resources now come under Okay. And when you take it another step further, you now take it to policy decisions. So how, what policy decisions are going to impact these hand washing behaviors, you know, and how do you make, make it openly accessible to people? You know, do people have to buy water in public places just to wash their hands? Mm. Or do you make the water freely available? And then as all of these things are happening at the individual level, community level, and then at the policy level at, you know, with a more national or regional spread, yeah. you then have to then think about what effect is all of this having in preventing infectious diseases. So that's where the data comes in. Yeah. So being able to manage um, the data, making sure that people are looking at the effect on infectious diseases and making sure that it's being used all the time, you know, being updated all the time to prevent just those infectious diseases mm. it's through hand washing. So in summary, public health is broad. It's um, yeah. so it cuts across both um, behavior change at individual level, helping communities, mobilizing them, and building co coalitions towards um, certain desired change that one health changes that one want to observe, yeah. and then the policy decisions, making sure there are resources, making sure that the data is made available. So that's um, in summary, that's public health. Okay. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to work in different, um, I would say, disease areas. Um, so HIV maternal newborn and child health, and then um, non-communicable diseases. Okay. So, and so my, my currently I'm working on cardiovascular disease. So I'm the founder of Vida Healthcare. Okay. A digital health um, startup that is dedicated at helping people of African descent to identify their risk factors for yeah. heart diseases. Um, and then we provide them with the resources that they will need to make changes in their lifestyle yeah. based on their life stage to reduce those um, risk factors. And then we monitor and track them up till for the rest of their lives, you know? So yeah. just to, so that, um, as you well know, the African continent is our people of African descent. Yeah you know uh bear the, the high risk of having cardiovascular disease yes. yeah. now let, let, let me ask you see i have I've known this this uh information for a long time but i have i've never uh explored why why are we more prone to have cardiovascular uh issues what was the the what 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 has the research shown? What 
we have or what we don't have that make that happen? Okay, yeah, so, um, yeah, so when you look at um, the word people of African descent, yeah. so you have to look at people who are, who were born um, and are still residing in the African continent. Yeah. And then you think of people who have left the African continent mm -hmm. a long time ago due to the slave, slave trade. trade and all that. Yeah. And then you then have to look at um, people who have also recently, maybe in the past um, uh, four to five decades, you know, migrated out of the African continent. continent. So it's always good to look at it that broadly because the risk factors in these groups of people vary. Okay. Um, yes, it even varies country by country. But however, there's, there's, there are certain risk factors that seem to cut across mm. um, everyone. So a lot of them are yet to be explained. So, so there are certain, you know, like what we call um, the structure um of the body and also the certain genetic um components mm. and that that we carry that put us more at risk mm. that just that so many of um but what we do know and um which the ones that lie within our control yeah basically stress Okay. First, yes. So okay. stress, um, and then our diet. Okay. Yeah. And then um, physical activity. And yeah. you can look at other issues around um, alcohol and tobacco intake. Mm. How, so now the first, remember the way I started, the first two around um, the way like for example we tend to our fat distribution tends to be mostly in the trunk mm, mm, so mm. when we majority of us when we add weight it's at the stomach yeah it's around the tummy you know so it's around the tummy and that's a big risk factor so that's just the way that's the way our fat seems to distribute itself mm. Whereas when you look at the Caucasians, for example, yes, yeah. you get that, but then um, it's more distributed towards the lower part of their body, mm. not the, the yeah. The, you still find a lot of them, yeah. You know, group you know, who have um, hot belly and all that, the large trunk. Yeah. Yes, but it's it's not as so for 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 most of us. I just want to make sure you get the right example. Yeah, you know, yeah. Easy for people to understand. So they'll say, oh, not so that they won't say, oh, pot belly is everywhere. <laughs> find out that if, for example, somebody of African descent is, is gaining five kg, mm. that five kg, most of it will be at the trunk. Yeah. While the rest will go elsewhere. Mm. While the Caucasians, fewer of it will go to the trunk. Trunk, yeah. While the rest of it will go down yeah. to the other parts of the body, but especially to the lower side of the body. Yeah. So I'm explaining that so that it's been it's the way the body is yeah. mm. the body mm. structure, mm. you know. Yeah. So that's um so but so they begin to get the pot belly when they are far heavier than us. Whereas you see a slim man, mm. very slim. But then yeah, stop. pot belly. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so that's typical of us. You know? So, but um, and then so and that um, the what we call that truncal uh, weight gain. Yeah. You know, around the tummy or pot belly, as we call it, that pot belly, whether it's male or female, is increases the risk of cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, so that it increases the risk of cardiovascular diseases because one, that fat is a bit different from the normal type, you know, fats yeah. in the body, and also because it's also very close to the vital organs. So those are the things that um, 
that's our body structure. Then yeah. the other one I talk about, then the other ones that we can change um, to some extent, how we process is stress. So you find out that we systematically from across whatever, whichever one category of African descent that one falls under, mm. you find out that we are more exposed to long-standing types of you know stress, mm. long-standing stressors. So, and when you look at stretch stressors, you're looking at both biological stressors and physical stressors and yeah. emotional stressors. So, infections, for example, you know, are stressors, and we are more exposed to infections right from childhood. Yeah. So, and then you know, then as we go get on, other things keep adding to the stress, and people are exposed to different types of stress depending on where they live and work. Yeah. So, that's um, that's one. Then our diets. Um, yeah. So traditionally, we've always kind of relied on substances like salt to mm. preserve, you mm. know, because we didn't have refrigerators. Yeah. So and salt, it's um, causes salt has sodium. Yeah. And sodium predisposes blood pressure. Blood pressure. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, and then we also have, we also have our traditional ways of processing food. So people, um, there's this, um, myth that, oh, oh, foods that are made at home are far, far, far safer than commercial foods. Yeah. So, but that's not, if you look at it from the cardiovascular angle, it's not necessarily true. Mm, mm. We process food at home. We make fufu at home fufu yeah. is processed yeah and the fiber taken away we make um pap at home where we take out most of the fiber in that's grains. that's true and we leave you know we eat the the sugar. starch, starch. Mm. that's true on and on you know we do the same thing to yam so and so those are the things that make that make us prone because just removing the fiber alone makes it um unhealthy wow you know, makes it unhealthy. <laughs> wow the fiber and this are uh, and so when you look at it this is our traditional way of eating mm. right mm. when you combine it with westernization where the western culture is making us to tilt more towards um Processed foods yeah. that are really processed. So, custard, spaghetti, or past, other forms of pasta, the noodles, and mm, mm. You know, all sorts of um, processed foods. Yeah. That people are all of a sudden our kids to make them happy is pizza. Yeah. Or, you know, so those things are, um, whilst, and then there's a shift away from our more our consumption of foods like legumes like beans uh, ukwa that's the breadfruit yeah um, akidi you know the, the another you know lentils like few of your those things have um left the food chain of majority of people africans of, yes that that's true that's Africa. true wow it has, it has left our tables and these wow. are things used to have those, um, I would say, protective um, effects from cardiovascular diseases. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then the next one is the physical activity. Yeah. So that's something that we still have. Um, okay. Yes, we, we still have it a lot in the yeah. village where people walk for long distance and they're happy doing it. They use their yeah. bicycle so we still have that but however in the cities um you have especially in the urban slums you have a situation where people do not have a, a, you know they they, they they get on the bikes mm. to move from point a to b yeah and there are no spaces for for them to walk or run yeah or have, and there are no safe spaces for other exercises and even in their homes, they're just managing some little spaces, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. space, like maybe skip or something. So that's um, 
And then the substances. So again, like in terms of alcohol intake and in terms of tobacco intake, we take these things also traditionally. So yeah. there's the high, high um, it's not just about beer, you know. Yeah, um, palm wine, all that. Palm wine, all of that. And the people think it's harmless because it's made from home. Um, even in terms of the tobacco intake, um, something like um, Amuro, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the tobacco powder. Yeah. Uh, so people don't ascribe risk to it because it's... Yeah, so yeah. Cool, you know? I mean, I, I know my grandfather used to take a snuff, okay? Yes. He used to take a, his a pipe, okay, uh, with right. a, with a, the tobacco is planted just outside his door. So my cousin just goes there, plug you the plug thing, it and then you pound you know? it. You know, yeah. And my 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 uncle also did, did that. Although uh, they lived uh, to their nineties, actually. So yeah, but but yeah. I I I know I know what you're saying. So hang on with that. So they live to their nineties, but how many more people in the village live to that? So you see, oh, that's yeah, what oh, yeah, yeah. That's one thing I have been telling people to when we are talking as Africans mm. is um, we have to start facing the truth, okay, and the realities, and this so that we we know how important it is, how urgent it mm. is. It's true that yes, one or two or a few people will live up to their nineties. Yes. But the life expectancy in Nigeria has consistently been fifty-four. Yeah. No, I, 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 I understand very well. How many other people live up to that? Even yeah. when yeah. the deaths are not caused by accidents. Yeah. Yeah. That does it does yeah, yeah, right. See. I, I use my uncles, my father now, he's nearly 80, my grandfather, my grandmother who, who died in their 90s. Yes, I use them as my benchmark, but I never think about my cousins, my uncles who died a lot younger in their 20s, 30s and 40s. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that's true. That is true. So so because there's this myth we have or this um thing when you're talking to people about to change their lifestyles. Mm, mm. Yeah, you know. And you said they'll tell you, oh, well, you know, it's all this your um you know too much, but <laughs> but in the village where people don't know anything, they're living up to 100, 90, and I'm like, how many people have you even tried yeah. to count it? And by and it's not also many of the people who they also think are old are not necessarily that old. Yeah. Uh, see, see, let me tell you. Even though I'm giving the example of my grandfather, my grandmother, my uncles, my grandfather's father died maybe maximum in his in his fifties. Mm -hmm. In my, my 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 grandfather on my mother's side died really maybe early maybe in, in his 40s so, so so i don't have more than one generation who have lived long in my family exactly <laughs> and and so and and again so those are the things that we need to consider you know yes we need to have yes the statistics shows that life expectancy is low the public feels that oh well it's just a few people who are exposed to this western thing mm. so we need to then bridge that gap and make sure that people know that the how does the statistics you see on paper yeah translate to what's happening in your loc locality yeah stage or community you know yeah. so and that's what where i think the conversations around cardiovascular disease and longevity and quality yeah. of life starts yeah because there is that poor risk perception you know about what the risk is and people feel what we do at home is safe anything we do that food that is in the house is safe well if you buy packaged uh, that's where all the problems start but it's not necessarily see what yeah. what we are what we are talking about today is uh very important uh if you of my audience uh have uh, have heard about my story but uh, I could have died at the age of uh, 35, 30, 38 when I had the stroke. 
you know i was i'm lucky i'm lucky to be alive today so uh and unfortunately uh we still don't know what caused my stroke and i know a lot say at least three people who i used to see weekly when i was in nigeria are dead or my their mates my mates they are dead and unfortunately they just slumped and died so what you're saying is very important there are things that that issues that we need to people like you public health uh, specialists need to help us to research to know what they are and unfortunately our, our society we don't do autopsy you see i i i know a family the father died young his other son died young the second one died young yet nobody nobody ever thought about doing autopsy to know what kills them you know so yeah uh the work you're doing is uh is important and uh uh see we need to dig into uh longe longevity research you know yeah 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 you are also an of course you are an an, an adv advocate of uh public health so what how is that going what is the what's the next uh, step for you in that your adv and your advocacy yeah so as we talked about um before yeah one has to be able to influence um policies that affect people so for the for cardiovascular diseases for example mm. we started in nigeria here by developing the multi-sectoral action plan okay preventing and controlling non-communicable diseases. Mm. So this spans across the spectrum of all diseases that are not caused by an infection. Um, so, but prioritizing uh, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, respiratory diseases. So this policy document was, I was one of the major contributors okay. and uh, drafters to this document. It was launched in um, 2019 um, to span for seven years. Okay. Where, so, where, where, can we, where can we get that document? It's can, okay, I will can send anybody, it. Can I will anybody send it. Yeah, it's, it's it? a link. It's, okay. it's online. So please, yeah. please send, send it link. Okay, send it link so that I can put this in the in the, uh, yeah, show, so the show document. Yeah. So the, and then after that, um, the Federal Ministry of Health um, had to then bring together different um, communities i would like to use communities for simplicity yeah different um people who practice in different fields even as far as you know the movie industry um we're all brought on board community leaders um advocates social media influencers so to promote the key messages in that document which were around uh, for example tobacco control um, is a major um, component to preventing um, cardiovascular diseases and other non-communicable diseases. So, and then you also have to think about what we just spoke about, the food, food industry. So there was an organization called the Global Health um, Advocacy Incubator. Okay. So they worked a lot on the advocacy part, bringing people together um, to make these policy changes. You know, to help support the government to make the policy changes, calculate what the benefits will be like, for example. Um, and they so and then, you know, other organizations as well came together to support them. So right now in Nigeria, we have a a, a sugar tax, like the sweet tax. So okay. yeah, so just to make sure that is you discourage people from taking yeah shoes. so it's, so it's not so so behavior change often is not just about um say don't eat sugar mm. 
So, but public health is when you make the, make it difficult for people to get access to it. And one of well, them. But see, okay, <laughs> sorry, uh, I, sorry, I, I'm I, I I I want to say something about say a sugar task. Okay, it a sugar tax will be imposed on the profits of the company. And unfortunately, what companies do, they will, they will raise the, 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 the cost of their product, maybe mm -hmm. two naira in addition, because of, because of, of a large population. Okay. They don't, they don't need to raise the, the cost of that product too much, just a little bit, and they will re recoup all the, all the, all the money. So I, I don't see. Uh, you have my, yes. my point is that I don't know if a task can can curb the level of consumption of this kind of food. I think we need to think okay. about some some other things. Yes. So, and that's where um, evidence lies. Okay. So in there's a strong evidence to show that um, sugar tax um, prevents, reduces. Okay, that's good. So in other countries. So as a country in Nigeria, it's our task to monitor the effects. Okay. So it's um, a tax that is fairly new, just um, a couple of years ago. So mm. it's so it's important to do the that's why i say that's where the data people the data yeah. specialists come in to do the analysis and actually see okay is there really a benefit mm. um from this tax and then another thing is um so preventing people from consuming you know i'm just giving instances of yeah. policy level, um reforms that i've been able i've been part of and you know successfully been part of so and then uh, we're still pushing, but then there's still a lot of issues around demand side uh, financing. So okay. that we that we are still facing challenges. So as you well know, um, only five percent of the Nigerian population are covered by um, health insurance. Yeah. In form. So out of pocket health expenditure is extremely high. So yeah. most people have to pay for their health care. And that's a huge problem. So that policy reform is, is challenging. Um, so there's a lot of work ongoing by the different um, coalitions, yeah. uh, society organizations, public health practitioners. It's not one, it's not a one person thing. Um, so um Every you know to make sure that we increase the amount of people who are in fact just make sure that we have universal health coverage and eliminate out of pocket expenditure, you know, at, especially among the most vulnerable. Mm. So these are people who are already because of their vulnerability exposed to all the risk factors for both infectious disease and non-communicable diseases and then yet they still have to bear the burden of pain out of pocket yeah so sometimes that's an urgent um, task by the government that needs to be tackled and the nigerian government is prioritizing that is still part of the priorities in this current um government after they released their statements okay. so yeah so we believe that um things will get better with time they've also put mechanisms in place you know for to improve this so it's not just about talk there's yeah. many of the state governments have been able to put together the state health insurance um systems and they're also bringing putting in place the community health insurance yeah, so that's, where, that's good yes so where people can um be signed up and then then of course nigeria has the basic health care provision fund so where the government puts in um, money to cover the most vulnerable in the population so again um these are all promising policy endeavors that yeah. have to be yeah yeah so so t t tell me something see i know getting this uh 
policies to get people to buy into them and to to do all that it's a it's a it's a very challenging endeavor you know uh so how how see i'm asking this because uh uh, I, I I'm sure I will have one or two people who are going through stakeholder management. So as a successful person in that, what are your what are the things you do to get your stakeholders engaged in in your endeavors? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So in terms of um the most important thing here is a community. You know, mm. and when people say community, not not geographical communities like in yeah. a geographical sense, but you look at look at the communities of practice of different people in you know different fields. Yeah. So, so there are always challenges, but of when course. you look as a community, so as uh, what I would advise every expert out there is join a community like join a professional association and then make sure that you the professional so you become very active in it so mm. as an active person look at the what are those issues that affect in your profession that affect people mm. that's 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 a good way to start so um I will usually give an example, like for example, um, teachers. You know, so a teacher within their community that they are seeing, they have the opportunity to interact with the local community where the school yeah. is. Yeah. Then, besides that, they're interacting with the parents and caregivers of. People and students, and yet they belong to a community of practice. That's yeah. the, the teachers, the thing. So, what are those issues around them that affect the their pupils and their students? Yeah, and that they can influence because definitely it's not everything that one can influence. Like yeah. I gave an example, like hand washing. Yeah. Do their pupils have enough, you know, space and resources to wash their hands and yeah. prevent infection among them? Now, once they're able to identify that problem and identify um, the root causes of the problem, so then what they do is to form, bring themselves together, and then they will get to talk to the community leaders. Yeah. To say, okay. Um, let's see how we can get a borehole um, open or a well or something. And then they then get to talk to some of the parents of their children who are highly placed yeah. and are policy makers and have the you know power to make decisions. So just that way, you find out that they've been able to influence and save lives beyond their regular teaching practice. Yeah. So... Wow. Um, yeah, so that's one example I can give. So yeah. in doing that, they can actually go as far as influencing the policy side of it because that's how this conversation starts. Yeah. So they can say, oh, the water. Then somebody says, yes, when we dig this well, but bear in mind that when we dig this well, when the dry season comes, the well will dry up. Mm. We need a more sustainable form of, um, water su water supply. And then when they say we need a more sustainable form of water supply, somebody will ask who is likely to give it to us. And then somebody will then say, okay, uh, let's talk to the local councillor. Then you go to the local councillor and then you then begin to ask other broader questions. Well, what are the capital projects that have been allocated to this community? You know, And then who are the people who are making those decisions? And then you continue until you get that problem solved. <laughs> it might not happen, yes. So it might not happen in one day, yeah. but yeah. being able to come together, being able to 
make sure that decisions are made um, together. Yeah. Is how you are able to identify the pathway to change. It could go as far as, you know, leading them to whoever has the decision, the, the capacity to allocate water projects, mm. in that community. And so that's how policy reforms. Yeah. And then once you now make that, then the next question is, okay, how do we sustain the water supply? Apart from now that we have, let's say, the pipe home water, how do we get money to change the pipes when they break? How do we get that? So um, those, those and, and to be honest with you, these things used to happen way back. Mm. So in the past, so I, I remember like in my community, they had a development union. Yeah. And through the development unions, they were able to put the, you know, the water pipes and then they were able to um, tell, think through like, how are we going to sustain these pipes? Yeah. And then they now either understand the, if, they, if they feel that it's very cumbersome to get the policy makers, then they do it as a community yeah. and tax people until they and change the 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 pipes when they break and and and, and those projects um have you know continued and i think yeah. so those are the things i observed as a young okay. person that okay. made me to get very 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 interested in in policy reforms okay even as a medical doctor it's not when as a medical doctor um, what really led me to public health was coming to hospital and seeing people dying in, in numbers. So um, I, I graduated from University of Calabar. It was, you, you see different diseases. And yeah. you, you get people who couldn't even afford paracetamol. As a medical student, you would have to go to work with your bag stuffed with different then you know, different um, denominations of money. So that if anybody asks, at least the, the, to, the, to the best of your ability, you're able to, and so, and then I start asking. Uh, out, of, many, out of pocket. Out of pocket. How many, ten, wow. how many patients can I possibly buy? How many syringes, you know? Hmm. How many, how much can we donate to get people to have the next round of dialysis? So what can we do better that can save more people? And that was what led me to, to the work I do today, to mm. import public mm. health. And then um, gradually observing the amount of people dying around me from cardiovascular diseases, as you know, and seeing the fact that it's not getting enough attention, even yeah. like I mentioned, even from the local people themselves and, and um, the, the policy makers you know, we have a lot of our, in Nigeria, our policy, health policies are skewed towards infectious diseases. Everybody's mm, affected mm, by it. Mm, yeah. <laughs> is a serious killer. Don't, um, it's, it's, it should not be underestimated. Yep. It's still one of the um, major killers of people who are under the age of five years, children. Um, and then you think of other infectious diseases meningitis, measles, you know, those ones are really, really very serious. But yeah. as people be, get old, then the issues around non-communicable diseases begin to emerge. Yeah. And you begin, like you rightly mentioned, you begin to see uncles drop at the age of 30, 40, as you know, and then you ask why. Why? See, that, why? That's, the, that's the question we don't ask enough. Why? Why? And then when you find out why, like in my case, it was mostly hypertension, diabetes, hypertension, diabetes. You know, I like to tell people this, that even as a medical student, when HIV was ravaging this country, mm. I lost more people to hypertension and diabetes than HIV itself. Yes. So it's, it's not, so when, so that's when I started asking, yes, HIV is important, but then 
What about the others? Yeah. What about, and then interestingly, people who survive HIV, survive tuberculosis, survive malaria, are likely to die of these other two. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, you're right. These other two. So um, at the end of the day, that's, that's where I decided to focus my energy and passion on. Um, yeah, because like I mentioned, I've lost more people from yeah. those diseases than complications of those diseases than any other, you know, disease I can remember. And um, in terms of pushing for the policies, yes, we are doing it um, and we're yielding results. That, results. That's good. That's good. No, it's slow, yeah. but the results are there, you know. That's good. But then, but then there's still a lot that people... So I found it Vidal because there's a lot people can do in their homes. Just yeah. have enough knowledge and awareness. Do you even know your risk factor? Yeah. So the guidelines in Nigeria, for example, it's that's where we start from. So, but can people then, I start asking, do people have to come to the hospital to get their risk factor done? They can't do it from their homes, especially with these digital devices. So that's saving lives. So anybody can go to our um, app, um, app.vidal.com. So, yeah, so, so you know what, all, all, all that information, please you give me that those information so I'll, I'll put them all in the yes. show notes, uh, notes. Yeah. Yeah, so people first find out your risk factor. Answer the questions truthfully. Once you find out your risk factor, then there are certain things you can do on your own um, while the policy changes are being made to protect um, yourself and then and your loved ones. Because the truth is um, about cardiovascular diseases is, is hardly a one man thing. Like yeah. I doubt if you eat, there's a meal at home that is made for one person. So every most people eat commonly. Same. Yeah. Same. Um, when you're going to the restaurants to eat, it's made for a lot of people. You just mm -hmm. order what you want. So that's why it takes a village, you know. So that's another thing people need to understand about change, any form of change, whether it's in the health sector or not, or any other sector, it takes a village. So everybody who is affected by that thing have to come together to change it and push for changes. Like, for example, um, foods in local canteens one has to look very closely at it and say, okay, to what extent is this healthy? Yeah. For, you know, and make changes and say, okay, if it's in a workplace canteen, you say, okay, please, for our workplace, we need less salt, we need less oil, um, oil, we need less sugar, you know, those kind of, um, those are the kind of changes people can start from. You don't have to wait until um, there's a government pronouncement, for example, um to <laughs> and and it's hard to regulate to ban outrightly ban harmful um food because yeah. it's it, it there's a lot of there's a lot of things around making decisions around yeah. food yeah, yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of uh, people pushing for one thing or the other and uh, yeah it's uh, it's it's difficult sometimes well uh, Bridget, your your work is uh, very important and uh, impactful. Yeah, I I wish you the best in those things. You are you are doing well. Uh, you are helping people, and uh, yeah, that's good. That's good. So let let's let's take this uh, a little bit uh, in my in my way. Okay, I like to read. Okay, and I like to encourage people to read now in your in your space there are certain books that can be helpful to my audience okay so please please recommend five books to them either in your space or somewhere else yeah most of my books that i enjoy reading yeah uh besides medical books okay so I usually will read a biography. Oh, very good. 
Yes. So make sure I read a biography and then read philosophical books that are shaped. Very good. Very good. Where I find myself at every point in time. Okay. So for biographies, um, last year I ended um, one of the, the two biographies I read that I think really um, got to me are uh, this one. So Onye Komenu's uh, biography. Ah, what's so, the title? My father's daughter. Okay. Yeah, I I yeah. heard her talk talk about it, but I I didn't read it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So my father's daughter is what I would say mirrors the life of every Bo woman. Mm. So it's it kind of um, takes time to outline our struggles. Yeah. Uh, the, the challenges we face. Yeah. And also, more importantly our conquest what we have been able to accomplish and Good. Um, the barrier yes and um, you know so that's one book that has really made a good impact very good all right yeah. then another one is this one uh by west hall okay no, so no, no bootstrap book when you're barefoot okay <laughs> yes um this book so first um it's about um and you know a very prominent canadian businessman mm. who is from jamaica and then so this thing about no bootstraps when your barefoot got to me personally because i'm a startup founder who decided to bootstrap my business and i'm like what's he even talking about mm. no bootstraps when you're barefoot and i think a lot of things he outlined here how he started his business the the risk he took and the mistakes he made really shaped how i look at bootstraps now good so yeah so how i look at bootstrapping so for example when people when you're trying to get your foot in the door and people ask for a lot mm. Um, it might not be like, for example, when people ask for if, if let's say I get into a partnership with you and yes, you're the one doing most of the work, but because you're using my name, yeah. I demand 50%. Mm. So it might look outrageous, but if that's what it takes to start, get started first, you know, don't overanalyze and just take that risk and see where it leads you. Mm, mm, mm. Okay, and then that's a good in one. In terms of shaping, um, this one I read a, very, a long while ago, and that's the one that took me time to find. Mm. Um, so the books that shape, the philosophies that shape our time. Yeah. So last year, I started last year by reading this book. Um, oh, yeah. I read that too. Yuval Harari. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. A Brief History of Humankind. This is yeah. a book. Everyone. very good Ex excellent um, book so because it helps you to know where you're coming from yeah where you're potentially heading yeah exactly so the reason and i also read uh homo deus yes the i read second homo one. Deus. i read homo deus so this exactly but this is where yeah. it's important it all starts there and um and so people should take time yeah uh, regardless of your field to read sapiens by y Yuval Harari. And then, um, as we know, towards the end of last year, uh, we saw, or middle of last year, yes, we saw generative artificial intelligence. Uh, oh, yeah. Boston, you know, becoming mainstream through mm -hmm. the whole um, chat GPT. Yeah. So then, um, that I was fortunate enough to get this book um signed by the raise it up raise it up so signed by the oh book. okay yeah the coming uh, way by i have it somewhere see i have a pile of books here yeah. Yeah, i have it there so yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so he was um one of the co-founders yeah of good mind so i needed this book helped me to understand you know what are those when um, chat gpt was released there was a lot of you know accolades mm. but beyond that there was a lot of apprehension yep 
how what um, could go wrong if generative AI continues. Yeah. So this book um, helped me to understand. Yeah. In fact, I, I was supposed to have a, a young man who's going to talk about this yes. on the podcast before you, but the same the same uh, issue I have in the house, I had to postpone his to next week. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so this book um, by Mustafa Suleiman, because I've yeah. been actively following the philosophy around AI. Yeah. Um, around, you know, so I've been reading and on the, trying to understand everything. Now led me to this one, which is yeah. the final one I'm currently reading. Very good. Uh, Unmasking AI by Ooh, okay. Joy. Yeah. By Joy um, Bulawi mm. Winnie. Blawini. So, um, so Joy's book talks about the coded gaze, you know, so um, the, the, the reality that AI models yeah. have been, are trained on data that are collected by, you know, all this, uh... by, um, you know, among the Caucasians and then not being able to, you know, decipher or represent people of African descent. Mm, mm. Very well. yeah. And how does this affect my work is the fact that even in the medical field, as we begin to look at the data that we are potentially going to be using for AI, a lot of them are from long-term studies that have been done yeah. in the past. Yeah. So... And for us, you know, we, we in Africa, we need to start thinking of how do we represent ourselves? Yeah, exactly. And that, that's, why, that's why I was happy that you are a researcher. We, yes. need, we need more African researchers. Yeah, exactly. So we, can, we, we, cannot, we cannot start continuing relying on what the West is doing, especially in, in the area of medicine. Okay. We have we have peculiar issues that only we can do the work. Yeah, very good. So, um, yes. So it's yeah exactly like for example sickle cell disease. Yeah, is something that it's more. I think I think um, it's Nigeria only only, is one of the, only people of uh, African de descent and some well, the other Asians few, have it too. Okay, but, Asians. Yeah. yeah, a lot too, but. Um, but one of the highest burdens is Nigeria. Not just that also, but also making sure that our ways of doing things yeah. are reflected. Like I just spoke to you about diet. So when you use data, for example, you're, we, the one that one of the things, you know, I like to talk about this, that in the course of my policy work. Um, well, uh, Bridget, let's, let's finish the book and then we'll, we'll go back to this. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's still the book. So okay. I'm looking at books now. I'm saying that you find out that anything that has to do with, like, I'll give you an example: Mediterranean foods. Mm. So Mediterranean diet is one of the best. It's, it's evidence based. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's associated with longevity, better um, reduces all cause mortality and yeah. all of that. So, but. How about elements of the African diet? Mm. Are we saying it's all wrong? Well, well, that's, okay. so that's maybe what not. Maybe not. But remember, what was our mortality? Let's say two centuries ago. Well, the mortality from two centuries ago, based on history, was mm. bad for everybody. So yeah, yeah. it was good for everybody. So. It, it was bad across board. It was bad across all the continents. Okay. So, yes. Um, I think, do we have enough, do we now, for example, do we have enough data, like, like the anthropologists and the rest? Do we know what our life was before it was disrupted by well. elements of colonization, slavery, colonization, and all of that? If we could even go back Mm. To that a little bit that could give us a picture of what what because the disruption disrupted a lot of things well see the, the, the same the same, the same so, kind of disruptions happen to everybody else 
Y yes, it happened to everybody else, but I, I, I would say that we are, we are, we are kind of in terms of documentation. Mm, yeah. And in terms of, I, I mean, I like to say this. Um, I don't know. I like, I avoid political discussions. <laughs> I don't want to, you can edit this out, but you know, I like to say this, that yes, it's true that the British people mm. went to China mm. and got in, uh, but then I don't know to what extent that they may penetrated mainland China. But mainland China still has their language intact. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah, because 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 China was the most uh advanced society in the world for nearly two thousand years. Yeah, so but here, but for, for me as an African in you know, of Igbo descent, here I am, my re religions um it has to be the western way of doing things well no nobody's forcing you <laughs> social, no you 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 can't see look no matter how no matter look even look let, let's let's not go too far even <laughs> government you know i always find it i'm always telling people that i don't know what authoritarianism looks like where i come mm. from because it has always been by consensus because so we don't know how it came it came military it was part of the military rule and then it was now like then democracy came and it has its own partisan democracy or whatever it is but in terms of consensus mm. bringing people umu and that together then you bring the yeah. different age grades to take a decision that there should be a water pipe it's so it's not authoritarian and i don't know how to i'm i'm always struggling to explain it to people because you know, the just like Chimamanda said, the danger of a single story. Yeah. Africa has been painted as a place where there was a lot of um, military coups and we prefer authoritarian way of government and we don't give room for democracy. And in this little vote, in, in this whole noise, just very few people, I don't, maybe very few people understand that there's still a large chunk of traditional Africa that takes decisions by consensus. Yeah. So when you even narrow that to what this lady is writing about, yeah. in terms of the, you find out that a lot of things about us is misrepresented. So I don't well, know to so what it's, extent it's, 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 it's for, for us. the other tribes, see? you know, for the other races. But I think v very good. See, see, this this is this is what I, I love. Huh? This is what I've been I've been asking us to do, research. Okay. We need to do the research ourselves and write books. We need to write books. Okay? I agree. Yeah. Totally so, agree. so all these things you are, you, are, you are talking about is for us to do the work, start researching. More people get into research in various areas of life and yeah. more people write books. And then maybe more people will read books. <laughs> I, again, <laughs> even the saying that we don't read books, it's a bit. Um, even the saying that we don't read books, it's no, for see, me, my sister, also, we don't we don't read books. Yeah, but do we have to read books in the Western sense? We have an oral way of passing things down to our. Okay, people. but can but, we continue but, it? Or, can or, we or, 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 it? Or, or, or doesn't work. No, record it. And doc I think the issue is that let's just say let's say documentation. When it's documented, and then people, people, yeah, because you see, we need to do things. We need to think of solving, even in public health. You know, you need to think of solving problems and getting to people. If people don't read, what do they traditionally do? Mm -hmm. So, if about have observed that we love storytelling and we love to listen, we love to listen. So, even when I talk diffusion of ideas, it's you know. It diffuses around. So yeah. can we even resurrect it? Can we resurrect a situation where a Kenneth beliefs for starting this podcast is recorded? And I have experienced it. Can I pass it down to another person? Like today, can I go tell another expert and say there's a podcast about Africa, African rising 
and you need to be part of it. Can you make out 45 minutes or one hour? And then you see, it diffuses until you are able but, to build see, a movement. Yes, this is. But this if is I it. say I can I write a book, it will take you a long time to write the book. Uh, and by the time you release it, then we. See, yes, see write my sister. Book. Okay, let, let, me just, let, let me just say this. See, <laughs> today we can, we can say this because the technology of recording either audio or or video is available okay yeah before 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 that the the best technology was books i agree okay now agree. If, even even with with uh recording right writing things down has a magical property it allows you to write, read your own writing, think about it, erase something, add something, and make it better. Tomorrow, yeah. tomorrow, come back. Maybe you, you take a walk and you think about it. Ah, that thing I wrote. You come back again, erase I something, you, add something. I know, else. I know. Okay. See, th that is, this is the difference between aura and writing. No, yes, but get you know what I'm trying to explain to you is I'm not saying books are not important. No, I, I know you're not saying important. so. Well, what I'm saying is um also making room for others, other yeah. forms, other ways of doing, yeah, you know, other ways of doing things and other ways of passing things. Because I feel that if we could if we could pass down the most important values to from one generation to the other in while we are documenting it. And even if, you know, I, because I believe that even the oral was cut, cut short somewhere, you know, when generations were taken away and when people were fighting different battles, it, that kind of lost it. But gradually, gradually, I think um, we are beginning to get back there. And, I'm, and, and I think that with the work you're doing and the work others um, are also doing by using these technologies to yeah. bring in a lot of people together then the you know the oral combined with the writing can continue yeah. but yeah. i think um but the bottom line is that we are overrepresented when it comes to things around um poor human development indices that's, that's yes that's, yes that's See, this this is a this is a, a job we need to make we need to turn that around see yeah. it's for you and me to do that okay so yes. the last is um yeah so t thank you very much for for those uh books uh i i i i would definitely get that book because i uh, i want to know what uh what that author is saying now uh, see, we have been on the on the on the podcast longer than what I wanted us to do. So you see, it's it's because uh, we we are having a, a very good uh, discussion. Let me let me go to the, my last question. Okay, what is your vision for us, for Africa, for Nigeria, in the next twenty thirty years time? Yeah, so my vision is for every person of African descent to understand their risk factors and for cardiovascular diseases and have all their data in their hands and possibly have AI models that will um, help the person to correct the abnormalities as is happening. Mm so that we can have very good quality of life and live longer okay and to start so in that case we don't shouldn't start a podcast with um us saying i lost my grandmother i lost my no everybody should still be there so that's my <laughs> I know I so, so 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 <laughs> you you have you have so we should be able to eliminate that you have embraced ai and the work what it can do to you for you that's Wonderful. that's interesting that's interesting. Yeah. See, uh, yes, uh, I want us to live long, but for me, 
for me, I used to think, ah, I want to live forever. Now I don't think I want to, I, I don't think I want to live beyond 90. Well, if what, you're 90, yeah? if, if you're 90 and age yeah. is only a number and your night, your functionality at 90 is the yes. same as it is today, you don't want to die. See, see, the, the point, the point is this. The and that's what we're talking about. The, the, the point is this. I'll, I'll tell you this. Yeah? Everything in this universe dies. Everything. See, yeah. even, even, even stars die. So why are we so bent to live forever? See, you, you know, see, I, 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 hold, hold on, hold on. I will take it this way. See, the people who are bent to live forever, they are afraid to die. Well, <laughs> you know, what about pushing the limits of the human knowledge? Oh, see what about what about conquering things? You know, um, that's what that's, he was that's, talking that's, about. That's, that's that. what we. That's what we Homo, have been doing. Sorry, well, yeah, like Homo Deus. So, what about? are doing the things that plague us the most see that is what see that is what human beings for me, have that's, always that's done my challenge so that's what i that's why should people drop dead from cardiovascular oh, no, no okay i will tell you i will tell you no not not I, not from any particular thing why would man die because the the universe is is designed to be born to live and die. Yeah, well, we don't know yet. No, Just we know. No, we no, do. We, we, we know. Don't. We do. We, we do know. because we because that's what happens everywhere. No, we don't know. We don't. Know <laughs> if it, we don't know if we could redesign it. Huh? So let's leave our mind. So my so, mind. So open. so we will become the creator. Hmm. Maybe, no, maybe we actually, it. <laughs> and we will be there and we'll be followed there yeah, for the people who believe in God. <laughs> yes, see, as, as he said my, we are small my God. sister, my sister, <laughs> I'm, I'm so so happy to talk to you today. See, okay. this kind of this kind of talk is exactly what I want us to do. Yeah, to think, to to explore things. And that is what I'm hoping we will do more and more and more in Africa, you know, to ask questions. Because uh, for me, uh, this century is the, the century for Africa. And uh, asking questions like this are the things that uh, we need to do. So my sister, thank you very much for being a great guest of uh, the Think Big for Africa podcast. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Yeah. Now, yes, Take you care. can design life. Bye. Yes, yes. <laughs>